And we are live. Um, welcome everybody uh, to another webinar of uh, Data Minded. And today it's a kind of a special webinar that we have today. Um, so I'm the host, Chris Peters. I guess most of you know me by now. And I have a regular guest with me, uh, Pierre. Uh, Pierre, can you also quickly introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining. Uh, I'm Pierre. I'm a data engineer at Data Minded and I'm a developer on Conveyor. Yeah. Which we can talk more. Indeed. So today is the webinar where we're not going to dive about a particular outside technology or a principle or a data maturity index or something. Was, today we announce our very own product called Conveyor. It used to be called something else, um, but now we, we did a, let's say, rebranding as continuation of our efforts. And the whole idea of Conveyor is that it, we're going to make it easy for you to get your data projects from ideation to production. Right, um, and so for that, I have indeed one of the one of the developers on the product I have with me. Normally, Stein would have been here. Stein is the tech lead of Conveyor and and the the main guy, but he he was attacked by Corona, so so I'll I'll be his replacement. But but all all work will come from Pierre. So Pierre, um, without f further ado, I'll I'll leave the floor to you. Uh, while Pierre starts sharing his screen, I'll also put a link in the chat um, for a Mentimeter, so you can already start asking us questions, and then we have a little bit little survey in the end, as usual. So here is the link. Uh, with that, Pierre, the floor is yours. Thanks, Chris. So yeah, today we are very excited to to announce Conveyor. Well, we announced it like ten days ago, but it's the first time we talk publicly about it. Uh, so. I want to give some announcements first, and then we'll quickly get to, to see what it's all about. So the first thing I wanted to say is that we have a, a brand new website, both for Conveyor and for DataMinded, the company, uh, dataminded.com slash Conveyor. You can go there and learn all about it and also try it for free. Uh, the second thing is that we published a more lengthy blog post about Conveyor, and uh, in there, we cover mostly what we're going to talk about today, but you have some more details. So if you're interested, uh, Chris will put all the links I'm sharing here in the, in the chat as well. The third thing I want to say is that uh, you can absolutely try Conveyor for free starting today. Uh, if you go to app.conveyordata.com slash onboarding, we have a fully guided procedure for you to install uh, Conveyor and start using it. So you should not be shy. Um, another thing is that uh, because Conveyor is a mostly de developer-oriented tool, we have a, a great documentation page, which you can find here at docs.conveyor.data.com. Uh, docs and finally, Chris uh, briefly mentioned it, uh, Conveyor is not completely new. It's actually been in the making for almost two years, and it used to be called DataFi. And in fact, we have quite already a few happy customers, so we're happy to continue this journey with a new name but it's not completely new. So that's uh, for the announcements. Now let's talk about a bit about uh, why we built Conveyor. So imagine the situation you are at the start of a new data project, and it can typically look something like this. Uh, you want to install some Jupyter notebook so you can do data exploration. Then you need to do some data preparation with your favorite tool, could be Apache Spark or anything else. Then maybe you need to train and evaluate some machine learning model. Uh, once it's ready, it will be ready to package all of this and publish this somewhere. Uh, you will have some work on infrastructure and you could use infrastructure as code like Terraform, or you could just click your way through the console in AWS or something like that. Then it will be time to think about scheduling your job. When do they run in which order? What, what are the dependencies and so on? And then if you want to improve your maturity of the project, you will want to do some automation with, you know, Circle CI, Jenkins, what have you. And then, of course, once it's running, you want to keep an eye on everything. So you want to look at the logs, uh, monitor the metrics, and so on. And then if you're a good data citizen, you would like to document your project. And so why am I mentioning all of that is that this can be quite overwhelming. Each of those steps requires some work that is not related to your project, which is just to set up infrastructure, tools, make sure that they work together. And this can really be overwhelming. And that's only the beginning of the story, because once you've done it for one project, you have cross-cutting concerns uh, becoming more important later. Like, how do I standardize this across multiple projects? How do I keep an eye on, on the budget? How do I make sure everything keeps fresh and updated? How do I troubleshoot my projects? And how do I make sure they are secure and data access is protected and so on? So you see all those aspects are really what motivated us to build Conveyor. 
And next, we have a, <clears throat> a small quote that we like in the context, and it's also in the blog post, is that the secret of get, uh, getting ahead is to get started, of course. And getting started uh, when something is complex, it can be made simpler but by simply uh, cutting the problem in smaller manageable tasks and then start on the first one. Seems very obvious uh, said like this, but it's really what it's all about when you have a, a data project from ideation to production. And this is why we built Conveyor. So let's have a look a bit more what we, why, do, why, why did we call it Conveyor first of all? Well, we noticed that all data projects need to progress through what we call workstations in a reliable fashion, just like a conveyor belt in a factory, actually. A uh, conveyor will take your product through their different life cycle stages. And so, for instance, here on the left side, you see that conveyor comes equipped with built-in integration with things like Spark, Airflow, Jupyter Notebooks, DBT integration, uh, manager infrastructure with Terraform, and so on. So those are built-in pieces in conveyor. But then, of course, it would be crazy for Conveyor to try to encapsulate the whole data landscape because there are many, many considerations in this, in this landscape. First of all, for instance, data connectors like Fivetran and so on. <clears throat> Another one is your dev tooling. Another one is where do you put your data in a data lake? Conveyor is not going to reinvent that. You might want to use Snowflake or Redshift or something like that. Then you need build tooling and you have you have you know standard tools for that like like github and github actions and jenkins and so on then when it comes to machine learning everyone has this uh, favorite flavor of it it could be mlflow could be sagemaker could be tensorflow could be anything uh, then of course everything we describe needs to run somewhere you need to, to actually compute right your, your your processing needs to happen somewhere that could be nowadays on kubernetes could be on lambda functions could be uh, anything, but this also takes a lot of effort to put in place. And then finally, you would like to have some governance on your data platform to make sure you know who's accessing the data, for what reasons, and so on and so on. So all of those, Conveyor is not trying to replace them. Uh, we're just making sure that you can connect easily with them and that you can have a smooth path where all those tools connect together. So that's the very, very big picture about Conveyor. Let's imagine that we've done this for one project end to end. Then the very next thing that Conveyor brings is a homogeneous yet flexible data platform in the sense that each of the vertical lines here is one data project. Of course, they're going to look very different internally because they're going to use different workstations. But in the end, what you would like to have is a you know, homogeneous process that you can understand looking from project to project, even though the tools are different inside each process. And so that also means that Conveyor is really not limited to one kind of, of uh, data project. For instance, you could do data science like we're going to do today. You could do batch processing with Spark. You could do real-time streaming applications with something like Kafka. Or you could do some data uh, SQL manipulation through DBT. And all of that is taken, in core, sorry, taken care of by Conveyor. We run on Kubernetes and we are multi-cloud. So this is a very high level introduction to what Conveyor is in terms of concepts. And today, just for the sake of demonstration, we're going to focus on one use case, which is data science with uh, Python. So now it's time to meet Conveyor. Uh, Conveyor is actually visible for the user with two things. The first thing is a command line interface, like many other tools like the AWS CLI and so on. So we have the conveyor CLI on one side, and on the other side, we have a web UI where you will be able to see everything that's happening and trigger some executions, uh, check the logs, the metrics, and so on. So those are really the two parts that a user will see in conveyor. Now let's go through a concrete use case. And for the sake of, of demo here, uh, I'm, I'm taking a small example that we have. And by the way, you have the GitHub repo here. It's, all, it's about the Titanic passengers and trying to predict if they have a chance to survive or not. And it looks like this. Uh, and the, the details don't matter here. It's really just to have a, an excuse for uh, the presentation. So the, the data looks like a list of passengers with their name uh, and some characteristics about them. Most importantly, there's a column saying if they survived or not. And then all the features are like, in which class do they travel, what's their gender, their age, and so on and so on. And the goal here is to build a classifier, which will just try to predict, given those features, is a passenger likely to have survived or not. And so when you give new data, like new passengers, without saying if they survived or not, the classifier will predict their likelihood to have survived. 
So that's the use case we're going to look at today. Uh, and so that's the stage of the life cycle of a project where you're at an idea, right? You just have an idea about how to do things, but now it's time to actually get to work and see how this can be done. I'm going to give now an overview of each of the steps uh, that we will go through before looking at the actual use case so you can understand what's the life cycle of this project. So now it's time to experiment, right? Uh, we, we need the first thing, the first challenge always is to access the data. Where is the data? In this example, it's on S3, could be anything, right? And you want to make sure you have access to the data for the scope of this project, but also that no one else has access to that data if they, they shouldn't have access. The second thing is you would like to do exploration in notebooks and setting up your own notebook is, it can be complicated. Conveyor comes with equipped with notebooks in the scope of your project. And then finally, in that notebook, you want to build and validate your prediction model. So this is really, a, you know, notebooks are great for that use case of quickly iterating and exploring the data, building a model, validating it, improving it until you're ready. So let's say now we have, you know, uh, we're confident about our prediction model and it's time to build some production code. So that's the next phase, right? We are at the build phase. Now it's time, <clears throat> sorry, to, to write code. Uh, if you're a good citizen, also to write tests and maybe even write this before the code. <laughs> That's another debate. Uh, and then once you have your code and your test ready, what you need to do is to package your code to make it available to run. And finally, we offer uh, a great tool in Conveyor, which is Conveyor Run, which allows something that is very critical at this stage, which is to have quick feedback cycles. Because when you code, you write your test, and the tests work, that's great, but you still want to see how is it going to run in production. And typically, in other platforms, you need to do all those manual steps to build and deploy those things somewhere, and then wait a few minutes, and then check the results, and then start again. Here with Conveyor Run, which we will see in the demo, you can really quickly just type Conveyor Run, boom, you see the output, you change a bit your code, you do Conveyor Run again, and your code is running in the same cluster as where the production code will be running. So there is no difference between your development cycle and putting in production. So that's the, the build, uh, what we call the build phase of the life cycle. Now, let's say you've iterated a few times and you're happy with the result. It's time to actually deploy this. And this is where uh, you will have some work to orchestrate your data pipeline. Because imagine it's not just one job, but a few jobs. You will need to say in which order they need to execute at what time of the day. What are the deep dependencies and so on. So that's the typical data pipeline orchestration. Um, we use Airflow for that in Conveyor. And then it's time to just do Conveyor Build, which will take all this information, which is your code, your, your orchestration, and any resource you need, and nicely package it to make it available to run. Next step is to deploy. So Conveyor Deploy will take that big package and put it in an environment. On, and that could be like a staging environment or production environment. And then I just mentioned staging and, and uh, production. The typical use case is to deploy to staging, have some automated tests there. And then once it's green and everything is good, you want to promote what you just built from, let's say, staging to uh, production. And that is a command also in Conveyor, which is Conveyor Promote. So now we've experimented, we built the project, we deployed it. Let's talk about uh, um, the, the run part of it. What's happening once you run your project, uh, you, you, you will want to monitor the execution. So for that, we offer an embedded airflow for each environment so you can see exactly what's going on about each of your tasks. You can, of course, view and search the logs of each of the tasks that is executed because that's very important. And then you can also look at metrics. Uh, you can look at CPU usage, memory usage, and see if things are going smoothly or maybe your uh, you, you're over capacity and you don't need such big machines to, to do your computation and so on. And then finally, if something wrong happens, you want to be notified. And so, for instance, Slack messages or emails when any of your task is failing. So this is like the running, it's more like the operation side of things, if you want. And then now we could say we're done, right? Because we have something that is running in production, we get notification when it doesn't work, so we're done, right? Well, uh, you might say yes for one project, but actually this is where scaling comes into play. And by scaling, I mean two things. I mean the technical scaling, but also the organizational scaling. Technical, what, I, what do I mean? Well, under the hood, to run everything like this, you need some kind of a cluster, right? And in, in the case of Conveyor, it's a managed Kubernetes cluster, which you don't have to worry about alone. 
The second thing is auto scaling. That's very important because you start with one project and a few tasks. But if you grow your team and you have dozens and dozens of projects, you end up with thousands of tasks and you want to make sure it can be scheduled at the same time. For instance, uh, could be midnight. We, we see that pattern a lot where everything is scheduled at midnight or at 2 a.m. So you want to make sure that everything is auto scaling and that you don't have a long queue for jobs to be executed. The next thing is uh, we have a conveyor as a, a deep Spark integration in the sense that you can run jobs uh, in a single uh, instance, but you can also have you know the typical distributed Spark job with a driver and executor, and you can scale horizontally quite easily. The other thing is uh, we let you manage your instance type, so the kind of machines on which the job will run in a very easy fashion. Instead of having all the details to fill in, we use T-shirt size like this is a large job, this is a small job, this is an X large job, and this lets you easily define um, the, the resources that should be available to a job. And then finally, with cost in mind, uh, we let you use something called on-demand or spot instances. So if you don't know what that is, this is typically on-demand is reserved, like re you, you're sure that your job is going to be executed and not fail. Uh, whereas spot, you, you are willing to uh, save money, but accepting that uh, your instance might disappear and you might have to rewrite it again. So that's really up to the the developer to decide uh, which kind of robustness and stability he wants versus saving costs. And so we offer all the, the possibilities there. So that's the technical scalability. Now, what do I mean by organizational scalability? Well, imagine you have more and more people working uh, on conveyor. Something that is really useful, uh, we have many features, but one of them is single sign-on. So you will onboard more and more people on the product. Maybe you have your own identity provider like Okta or Google or what have you. This is something that we have in the product. The next thing is cost management. We will see it as well. We have dashboards where you can see exactly which projects and which environments are costing more money so that you can track if it's keeping, if it's uh, behaving and kept under control. And also what are the low hanging fruit to, to improve uh, the cost. The next thing is a role-based access control. And this is where you have many people working in your organization. You need to make sure only the right people can work on the right use case. And then a final example is a customizable template. So let's say you have a really good first project where you embedded all your best practices, all your best libraries and so on. You can make it available as a template for the next projects to your teams. So those are just a few examples of how a conveyor helps you scale. So enough talk, let's, let's uh, see Conveyor in action. Um, what I'll do now is I switch screen to this screen. I hope everything is big enough uh, for you to see. So here is the first time you see the um, Conveyor UI. I will be using this, of course. I will be using the CLI here when I need. Here I have a code editor just to show the code we're, we're looking at today. And here you can follow the progress of where we are in the different life cycles uh, steps. So. Conveyor is here, I'm logged in. Uh, you can see the first things, uh, the first concepts that are important are environments. In this case, we already have two environments. Environments are really things like staging production, but it can also be, you can think of it as a, a sandbox where you can do uh, your work. And for instance, uh, you have staging and production, that's pretty classical, but you can also do I'm a developer, just like a Git branch that is disposable, I could really easily create an environment. And let's create one here. Uh, you know, I can call it test. And if I create it within a few seconds, I have a completely new environment ready with its own airflow embedded into it. And later I can just quickly get rid of it. So that's really the idea of environments is that they can be long living, like staging and production, but they can also be short lived and disposable. So let's create one that we will need later, which is webinar production, prod, to make it shorter. But I already created a dev one uh, for you before. So this is an environment. Now a project is your data project where you will write your code, et cetera, and then you will deploy that project to one or more environments. So those are the two main concepts that we need to understand. And now, <clears throat> Uh, we have created an environment. So if I wait a few seconds, I should be able to see here that I have my own airflow that I will be able to see what's happening in this environment. Now let's demonstrate back to the, um, the Titanic use case. It's the exploration phase, right? So I'm gonna go to the CLI. 
no, first of all, sorry, let me show you the code. So this is the project that you can find on the GitHub repo and it's a Python project. So we have some requirements uh, and we have a Docker file and then we have our source code and we have our notebooks. But let's say we didn't write the code yet. Well, all, we, all we want to do now is access the data and look at the notebooks. So for that, I, I'm gonna use the CLI and I'm gonna create a notebook, which I'm gonna take the comment here. So I'm saying conveyor notebook create, I'll give it a name and that's it. And I need to select on which environment I want to run that notebook. So that's an important thing, right? Notebooks will run exactly in the same environments as your final production code. So I'm selecting an environment and it's gonna create from my local code, put everything in a nice bundle and I will be able to access my notebook in production. So we wait a few seconds here and the notebook will appear here. You see exploration, it's ready. So now I can open this notebook inside of data file. So if you're familiar with Jupyter notebooks, this will not uh, feel unfamiliar, but otherwise uh, you just have to know you can basically open a uh, notebook. So here I have a first notebook and I won't go through all of the details, but here I'm loading some of the uh, dependencies that I declared in my request um, in my uh, requirement file. And for instance, here I'm loading data. So you can see what, what is important to notice here. I was able to use my libraries as I will be able to do with my production code. I was able to access some secret things on AWS because I used an AWS role. So we have data access control and I'm indeed able to show some data from files on S3. And then later, of course, and I won't go through the details, but you would go through your typical exploration, look at your data, do some statistics on it, do some plots, and so on and so on. The, the goal being to finally build a model. And, and so, Pierre, maybe to add to that, the problem we want to solve here is that very often we see um, teams where their notebook environment is completely different from their production environment. And there is a big gap between the two, and it's very hard to move from notebooks to production. Here, your notebooks actually run in production exactly what Pierre said, with the same libraries, with the same permissions, with the same everything. And that should make it easier to iterate back and forth and, and to use notebooks when, when needed to switch to IDs and stuff. So that's the problem we're trying to solve here. Yeah. Exactly, is, is to, to remove the gap that is typically like, I'm done in my, my notebook, now time to put to production, throw it over the fence to someone else, and we have to start from scratch, what dependencies, dependencies were used, how did you access the data and so on. Here we use the same things. So again, if I look at the code, I had my requirement file saying which dependency I'm going to use. Um, I've, this is exactly what I'm going to need in production. So there, there won't be a difference basically. Okay. So, you, you know, let's say we've been doing this exercise um, of, you know, validating the data, exploring, building a model. Now it's actually time to go to the build phase. So now let's write some code. Um, so I'm going to take this. So now imagine you were happy with your notebooks and now you just wrote some simple jobs. For instance, some, some code to validate your data with pandas, and then you have some code to prepare your data, and then you have some code to, to uh, train a, a model, a classifier. Again, the details are not about the code here today, but it's about the process. So imagine we've done all of that. And then finally you have a job that is able to use the model, taking new data and evaluating the model. So you've written all that code and you've also written a Docker file just to say how to bundle your code. And that's it. So that's nothing special about conveyor here. That's what you would do probably uh, with, with any uh, platform or framework. But then now uh, what we can do is here do a conveyor build. And as we said, this will take all the resources uh, that are needed, the code, the dependencies, the, the DAG declaration, so the orchestration part, put everything in a nice bundle and it will be versioned and we will be able to deploy that. It's also validating, uh, if you know Airflow, it's also validating your DAG, it's it's shipping everything. So now it's 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 been shipped, it's time to deploy it. So now we're gonna do conveyor, uh, where is it? No, sorry, I forgot what I wanted to show now, sorry, is this very important thing, conveyor run. So I'm still developing, right? So 
now I can do a conveyor run and I just need to say on which environment I want to, to run. So I'm going to uh, run on the webinar dev environment. And so what it's going to do is take my code and execute one of the jobs that I will select here on this environment. So exactly as it will be running in production later. And this is the, the iteration that I can get as a developer. So uh, just to show that it's actually, uh, you can iterate, let's add some log here. Logging.info well done. So the typical thing you would do to debug, add something here. Uh, if you go back to the CLI, now it's gonna run the task for the first time. So let's see that. And while, so we, yeah, sorry, sorry, Pierre, go ahead. Um, yeah. So I, I'm gonna run the first yeah. task, which is the validate data, yeah. right? It's, it's this job here. And it's it's shipped to the cluster running exactly as the as the root job, right? So now we see that this is happening. Now if I run it again, because I modified the code, it's gonna ship the new code and run the new code. So this is a shortcut. Uh, uh, you don't have to do all the typical steps of bundling your code, uploading it somewhere, then re-trigger it somewhere, wait for it to run. You just do it from your command line. So you don't leave the realm of your IDE command line. So <clears throat> this is conveyor run and just let's wait a few seconds to see Chris you wanted to yeah, say something in, indeed this comes back to the quick iterations part just like we want to bridge the gap between notebooks and ID code here we bridge the gap between your laptop and a production environment so you can quickly iterate on your laptop change there do a quick uh, conveyor run um, deploy again um, and that should make your if you can iterate in five seconds instead of five minutes or five hours then it's a lot a lot quicker to develop and it's one of the features okay. that we didn't have in the beginning and i think now it's one of the most common used features of, of conveyor like like engineers love the, love this one yeah. so now you can see the the log we added here and all of that run on the cluster which is going to be the production pierre i also have a question so I... from the audience he's, they the audience asks how do the underlying data sources relate to the conveyor environments production data sources in the dev environment question mark uh, so <laughs> the complex question. So, so the way we, we deal with this is that each project in Datafy is going to uh, use, in the, in the case of AWS, IAM roles. And those IAM roles you should configure on the side of, of Conveyor saying that that role can use that and that data source, for instance. And then we have the notion of environment, right? And so you should have a role per environment. So let's say you'd only want to access staging data, that role should only access staging data. And we will see later how that, that is done, but it's basically about that. It's about compartmenting which role can do what in which environment, and then there's a link with the project to that role. Indeed, you can be very simple about it and give one admin role to do everything for every project in every environment. And that works for small teams, by the way, but for bigger teams, ideally every project, and every environment has their own permissions. And, and we enforce that those permissions are actually uh, being used, but you set the permissions outside of Conveyor, yeah. So now if we go to the webinar uh, dev environment and we go to task execution, you will see that I've run indeed manually uh, via, conve via conveyor run the task twice already. And so that's that's conveyor run. So now that, that leads us to uh, deployment. So now I'm, I'll quickly go to the different steps. So now we are ready. We're going to do a conveyor build. Just going to package everything. And then we're going to do conveyor deploy, which will put it in some environment, for instance, in the in the dev environment, and then finally we can do a promote. Yeah, so this is building and uploading, done. And now if I do a deploy, so here I'm saying conveyor deploy to the environment webinar dev, and just waiting for it, and it takes roughly 30 seconds. And what we will see is that in this airflow of environment, we will see a new DAG here, which will be executing the task we created. And this again, trying to um, lower the barrier for you, because if if you don't have these simple command line tools, you have to do all comp all kinds of complex uh, manual tooling and manual uploading of YAML files and whatnot. This is just a simple command that you can just enter in your CI CD system. Any CI CD system basically makes it easy for you to go from your laptop to dev to prod and, and, and so forth. Yeah. yeah. So now we see that the DAG that we created is here. 
And it's basically all the steps we define, validation, preparation, training, evaluation. And if I trigger <clears throat> the execution of that, we will now see finally the runtime of DataFi, which is all those tasks are, are going to be running on the cluster, on the Kubernetes cluster. And again, those run exactly the same way we run it from the command line with conveyor running, right? So there, sh there should be no surprise at this stage. What you see here is exactly what we've seen in the CLI, but now it's ready to be put in production. So now you see, for instance, the first tag has already completed. That's the typical airflow view. Now, if we go to the task execution, you will see the same task here. And if I open one of them, I will be able to see the logs of the task. Okay, and I, I can also see the details. In this case, we configured it to be a nano t-shirt size uh, because it's a very small task and lifecycle is spot and you can see all the details of the task here. So that's <clears throat> for the um, deploy part. Maybe I can quickly show. So remember we created an environment that is production. I will quickly do a promotion, uh, but you get the idea. So now we're happy it's running in dev. We're gonna do a promotion, which is saying, take exactly what was deployed for this project to the development environment and promote it to production. So again, 30 seconds and, and in 30 seconds, when we go to the production environment here, for now it's verging, there's nothing, but we will see the new mm -hmm. Titanic uh, tag appearing. And this should help you get to 10 deploys a day, right? That's the, the magic metric that everybody yes. wants to achieve, 10 deploys a day. Um, it should be possible with, when deploying this, is this easy, right? And again, very easy to integrate with your CI CD because the, the commands are completely standard, right? Like conveyor build, conveyor deploy, conveyor promote, no matter what is inside of your project. So now we see it's indeed been deployed to the production environment, same thing. So yeah, you get the idea. Okay, so now next step. So if I go to run, uh, I showed you already that you can monitor the execution in Airflow. You can view and search the logs. You can also see some metrics. So for instance, if I take a, build, uh, a Spark task here, that's a completely different task, and I open it, you can see that we have the logs like we've seen before, but we can also see metrics. So in the case of a Spark job, you have a driver, you can see the CPU usage over time, and you can also see all the executors, CPU and memory usage over time. So it's easy to keep an eye on, on your jobs. And notification, you can define some threshold and, and push notifications to Slack or to email if something goes wrong. So that's the running part. And now quickly the scaling part. I won't have time to demo everything, but let's, so we've seen the auto scaling, we've seen it implicitly. You would have, of course, to take it to a much uh, higher load to, to see it in full action. But imagine you have plenty of projects uh, triggering on plenty of environments. All of that needs to scale automatically, and that is exactly what Conveyor is doing. Spark, we've seen briefly now how it integrates. Uh, yeah, I think we covered all of that. The single sign-on I mentioned, the cost one. Let's have a look at cost. So on the cost page, you can see your different environments and see which one is costing the most. You can look at it per week, per month. And if we click on a specific one, uh, for instance, this one, we will see the cost on a daily basis, the evolution uh, or the, the past month. So it's really easy to keep track of the project. The typical reason for a project to, to increase cost is you, you start ingesting more and more data, for instance, but it might be that uh, there's something that you didn't see before and you know you suddenly see a, a big spike, so it's worth looking at. And also uh, in, in reality, some, some engineers are more lazy than others. And so you see, if you have 20 projects in your team, then some some projects are like 10 times more expensive than others. And it's just because uh, engineers, they just like to throw more resources at a problem. And then it, it, it helps you to focus on like these two projects, if we can scale them down in terms of cost, that will help us more than fixing the other 18 projects, right? Yeah. yeah. And then finally here, we mentioned RBAC um, briefly to explain. So here I'm on an environment and I can say, this person is an admin on, on that environment, so he can invite other people to use this environment. And the same thing is true for projects. So if I take the title of project right now, there's going to be a single user who's me, but uh, I can also invite Chris to start working on, with me on this project. And it can be either 
an administrator or it can be a contributor. The difference being that an admin administrator can do more things, of course, like deleting a project, inviting people to it, and so on. So with that plus IAM roles, you can really have fine-grained access to who can work on which project, meaning working on which data. Indeed. And maybe one thing to add to that, if you, if you go back to the environments in terms of scaling, what's also nice, what Pierre didn't mention, is that now everything runs on one cluster, like the default cluster, but it's, it makes perfect sense if you're a large organization that each team has their own cluster in their own network with their own whatever. And that's perfectly possible. So, so you can have one, two, five, 20 clusters. It doesn't really matter. And just environments live on clusters. So for you, it's almost transparent. You just deploy to an environment and that environment lives on the cluster, right? So you don't have to worry about where the cluster is. Yes. So yes, I'm looking if I wanted to show something else. I think, I think of course there's plenty more to show, but we are limited in time. So I, I don't want to take much time. But that gives you hopefully an overview of it. One last thing I just want to mention is that we have also built in a, a guided tour. So that the first time you, you try Conveyor, you can really go through the different steps and it will even help you deploy the Titanic project we just did uh, in an interactive fashion. So you can really have the, the full experiment here. All right. So back to slide for a moment. So short recap of what we've seen. So Conveyor is really there to take you through all the lifecycle steps of your data project, mm -hmm. from idea to production. Once you've done a project, it's really about keeping an eye on all your data projects under a single roof. That's very important when, when, you, when you scale your organization. And it's, it does it in a uniform process. So like we said, in, it, integ sorry, it integrates really easily with CI, CD, because it's always the same way to build, deploy, promote, and so on. And then finally, Yes, this is bringing a lot of structure, but you don't want to re remove the flexibility and the freedom of developers. They still need to be able to use the best tool for the job. So we support batch streaming, data science, and, and data warehousing. You, you can do all of those use cases using the, the language of your, short, of your choice. Of course, then it's up to the organization to, to put <laughs> restrictions on what to use, but Conveyor supports all of them. So that, that's the recap of what we've seen today. Of course, we will do other webinars where we'll go more in depth technically. Here it was more of an overview. Uh, very important, you can try Conveyor for free today. Uh, we have, like I said, we've built a fully guided onboarding experience. So you can replay the exact scenario we, we built today at this address. And it, it really takes you by the hand. So there's there shouldn't be anything too difficult to do here. Uh, and like I said, there's also a guided tour inside the application too to help you. Um, Chris, you want to maybe take this one? Uh, yeah, sure. So um, we we are at the very start of this, let's say, conveyor journey, although we're, we've been live with Datafy for a couple of years. And one of the big things we're trying now is um, we don't want to, we, we're already doing top-down selling. So it means I go talk to CIOs and to enterprise architects and stuff to convince them of the value of conveyor. But we want to change it a bit because those that process takes a long time, to be honest. And we want to do bottom up, um, uh, bottom up driving usage, basically. So, so we want to make it as easy as possible for everybody to get started, just like you just get started with Slack or Zoom. In the same way, we also just want you to get started with Conveyor. Um, and there is a very generous free tier available where you can really do a whole bunch of data projects without entering credit card details or talking to boring salespeople like me. Uh, and so the, the challenge we have for you is that um, we, we, uh, you can join our Slack community indeed, but um, the challenge here is uh, be one of the first 10 people to complete the project that Pierre just did on the free version of Conveyor uh, and show us the result on Slack. And if you do that, uh, you already get 5,000 core hours per month for free, which is, which is a lot, but you get an, an extra 5,000 core hours for free on, on top. Um, and you also get a, an onboarding session with the team um, so they can help you guide uh, setting up your first project. So see this as a, as a fun challenge. Uh, if you're one of the first ones to do this, um, there is a, well, a, a little prize in it for you as well. Um, yeah, I think, uh, Pierre, with that, I think that's the most important thing we want to say. Indeed, um, now uh, the, the second part of the webinar is indeed questions. I, I think there's some more questions popping up. Um, let's see if there's, yeah, this was question three. Pierre, I'm going to uh, give you some more questions. Maybe I can answer them. Another question is what does it cost? Well, the, the free tier, as I said, for 5,000 core hours per month, 
um, indeed this slide is completely free, just like Circle CI. You can do, uh, I think, like run a run a few projects completely for free on conveyor without without any without any any need. It's only when you start to scale, then it starts costing five cents per call hour. With there, we're still significantly cheaper than let's say a Databricks or a Snowflake or any of the other ones. So so it's still a a net win for for your team. And then finally, enterprise. If you really want to have a lot of clusters, if you want to have SSO support and all of that, then unfortunately you do have to talk to sales. But, but I'm, I'm not the worst person in the world, so so then you have to talk to me. <laughs> but but this is the yeah. Go ahead, Pierre. I just add something. That, so it's free, of course, but the the infrastructure is running on your AWS account, so you will have those costs, yeah. right? So just to be completely transparent, the engineer so always has to charge. Like... <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course. Maybe we, should, we we weren't clear about that. So all of this runs in your account, right? So we don't see your data. We don't. There's no processing coming to us. There's no code coming through us. Like everything lives in your AWS or Azure account. We're available in AWS and Azure today, um, and everything is. In, yeah, you can choose where it runs, right? We we just we just run it for you. Um, so that was uh, that question. There was another question. Uh, which cloud environments do you support? You mentioned AWS, your preferred choice, which others? Well, so uh, AWS was the first one. We now also have a client, which we unfortunately can't name, but we have a secret client on Azure as well. Uh, we hope to have a lot more Azure clients. And in the future, definitely GCP is on our target list, right? Uh, I don't know, Pierre, if you have something to add to that. Uh, no. <laughs> yeah. It. Yeah, th there's even, uh, but, but, Pierre will deny this, but but I I would even like it if one day we can be on sort of on-premise open shift environments, like wherever there is a Kubernetes, we should be able to run. But of course, running on on-premise environments is, is ten times harder than run, running in the cloud. So so that that would be a let's say a next step for us. Do we have a preferred choice? Well, we have the most experience in Amazon. We like Amazon a lot, but but typically it's not a matter of choice. Like probably your company is already existing, like running. A cloud, right? Either AWS or Azure, or Google, or maybe all three of them. And so it's a matter of going, going where you already have services. That is the easiest part, right? Um, Saima says uh, running on-prem will also be good. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, indeed. So, so it, it would be super nice if, if that's in, in the end the idea that you're completely cloud independent, right? So you have all your logic is in Docker containers, which can run everywhere, and with conveyor you can just now run this on Azure, run this on AWS, run this on-premise. Because in reality today, most clients we have are actually in a hybrid scenario where yes, we're going to the cloud, we're investing a lot in that, but we're gonna have some on-premise workloads that's gonna keep on running for maybe five to 10 years or something. So the reality is a hybrid cloud environment. Uh, like people like me, we wanna go all in on cloud, but reality is hybrid. So, so I hope that sooner or later, we're also going to be available on-premise, but that would be a next step for us, yeah. Um, I think, with that, those were the questions. Are there, are there any other questions? Um, no, I think we answered all of them. Um, so um, if you can stay a little bit longer, I have a few questions for you for the survey uh, to get your feedback on this. Uh, will there be a recording of this session? Yes, yes. Um, it's automatic. I think you automatically get an email. If if not, I'll make sure that there's an email sent out. This, this will also be published on YouTube, so you can see this on, on YouTube as well. Pierre, you wanted to add something? No, exactly. That. Yeah, right. Cool. <laughs> um, so, um, to the to the Mentimeter again. Now, so I'm, I'm going to copy paste the Mentimeter link again. Um, so, uh, I'm going to ask you a super biased question to begin with. Um, so, do you plan to you to, to use it to try it out? Um, and you can choose between yes, of course, one hundred percent, definitely, or yes, but also no. So, <laughs> I'm curious to find if uh, if people um, uh, will try it out. Uh, okay, so two, yes, but also no. So that's not good. Three, yes, but also no. We need more, yes, of course, or definitely, yeah, that's better, that's better. Um, maybe I'll, I'll share my screen while I do this because you, you yes. don't see you don't see the answers. Yes. Right. Oh, uh, here we go, oh, boom, share my screen. Is it, uh, yeah, it's there. So uh, we're about 50-50, I would say. Six say yes. Uh, six say no. Well, yes, but no. But <laughs> all right. But this was more of a of a joke question, if you will. Um, but but again, uh, we're serious about it. Be one of the first ones to 
to get what Pierre just did, get it up and running in your own environment and you get some free credits and some some nice advice and, and, and uh, uh, meeting with our engineers. Uh, so see it as a challenge for you. Now a more serious question. Um, so if you would rate this webinar, um, was it relevant for your daily work? Um, is this useful to you? Um, the slides that we produced, the online aids, the handouts, were, were they clear and helpful? Uh, were the speakers clear and helpful? Um, did we structure the webinar well? Did it have the right pace? Uh, and would you recommend this webinar to a colleague? Um, and this is the more serious feedback. This will help us um, improve over time and, and make, make even better webinars. Yeah, so there's a few first responses coming in. All right. Cool, thanks. Thanks a lot for that. We'll wait for a bit until, until we have some, some answers there. Um, yeah, okay. So in general, it's it's positive. It's not perfect. It wasn't a home run, but it's it was good. I, <laughs> I like to hear that. Um, if it if it didn't have the right pace, I'm going to ask a, an open ended question in a bit, or leave it in the chat. Was it too fast? Did we bring too much content, or was it too slow? Was it a bit boring? Let me know what we can do about the structure and the pace, because that that seems to be the yeah one of the most difficult ones here. Okay. Um, then one one next question. Don't worry, it's not twenty slides like this, but but just in terms of technical setup, how was the audio, how was the video, and how was the 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 webinar platform where we're using Demio? That's what the platform is called. Was it good for you? Were you happy? Uh, Jeroen said it was a bit fast. Bert also said it was a bit fast. Uh, depends a lot on what you're used to on a daily basis. Yeah, Pierre is a bit faster. <laughs> <laughs> Gary is a fast engineer. No, but it's good to know, guys. Th thanks, <laughs> thanks for that feedback. Um, Tim says more context would also be good. Tim, what kind of context did, did we not give? Um, what, what kind of context were you were you looking for? Um, and in the meantime, there's also any any suggestions to improve on our webinars. Um, either leave them in the chat or in Mentimeter. Uh, that would be super helpful. But the real end result of the conveyor belt. Yeah, that's a good point, actually, because we, we we stopped and now your project is running, but so what? Is it a trained model? Yeah, okay. Thanks, Tim, that's good feedback. Um, uh, we'll, 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 we'll do that in the next webinar. All right, uh, with that, I think we can wrap up. Um, uh, th thanks all for joining uh, to see a model deployed and result of the process. Yeah, okay, we'll take that with us. Thanks, that's very good feedback. Um, thanks all for joining. Uh, the video will be available. Get in touch. Find us on Slack. Find you'll find us right. Uh, send an email, and I hope to see you on the on the conveyor platform. All right, guys. Take care. Thank Bye. You. Bye.